in the lucky country. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I rise to join other colleagues in uh, making some remarks of condolence uh, here, the, here this afternoon to, um, on the passing of uh, late Malcolm Fraser, ACCH, Australia's uh, 22nd Prime Minister. Uh, on Friday morning, when uh, the news became public of uh, Mr Fraser's passing, the first thing that came into my head was the sound of Malcolm Fraser's voice, which I had always found so very compelling. Um, through my uh, career, in, uh, not just in this place, but starting in politics uh, at a much uh, younger age. It was uh, intimidating. It's, it was imposing. His stentorian tones, I think, come to everyone's mind uh, when you say the words Malcolm Fraser. And uh, even that voice, I think, will be sadly missed, Mr President. I think the opportunity to pay respects and to say some words in condolence motions such as these on the passing of Australian Prime Ministers, and we've had to do it too regularly in recent months, is a very important part of what we do in this parliament. Uh, as, uh, as Prime Minister today, Mr Abbott is only Australia's 28th Prime Minister. We are a young country and we have had very few leaders, relatively speaking, but the demands and the tasks uh, and the burdens which we ask those individuals to carry, no matter which party they represent, are, I think, Mr President, enormous. And for uh, an, an operation that tends from time to time to get a little carried away with itself, uh, this chamber and in the House of Representatives, not always the most edifying uh, performances uh, one suspects for, uh, for those who are minded to observe, the opportunity to be much more edifying and to pay very serious respects to those who have taken on the burden of leadership as our Prime Ministers is, in my view, very important. And uh, I think the way in which the parliament marks these um, occasions is, uh, is something we should not lose. As a champion for the people of the world, for the rights of the most vulnerable people, Mr Fraser was tireless from refugees to Aboriginal Australians. Uh, in my view, he was part, an irreplaceable part of the broad church that is the Liberal Party of Australia. In later years, of course, he even grew close to his old foe, um, the late Australian Labor Party icon, Gough Whitlam. I think today I can say with great confidence that the passing of Mr Fraser has touched almost everyone in this place, no matter their political branding. Serving three terms as Prime Minister, he was, of course, a central character in one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial, event in our nation's political history, the dismissal of Prime Minister Whitlam and his government by Governor-General Sir John Kerr in 1975. That, uh, if nothing else, marked an important place in Australian history for Mr Fraser, but there was so much, so much more. When he came here, aged 25, he was an Oxford graduate, he was a grazier, and he won the Victorian seat of Wannon in, in 1955. He was the youngest member of, uh, of that parliament. And for those of us who did try to enter politics uh, or elected politics in our 20s, uh, Mr President, I have to say Mr Fraser's name was regularly invoked as a very good reason for choosing a 20-something political candidate uh, whenever, uh, whenever asked, uh, how could you possibly imagine you might want to do this at such a young age? And I always thought arguing with the uh, case of a former Prime Minister, as my, as my example in point, was very powerful myself. It took me some time to persuade the selectors uh, that that was the case. He did, of course, marry uh, Tamara, or Tammy Beggs, a year after he became an MP. And uh, they, uh, they forged an extraordinary partnership uh, for our nation and for their family, of course. Much has been said today in this place and, uh, and in the other chamber of Mr Fraser's achievements as a minister, as prime minister, and of the achievements of his governments. I want to, uh, Mr President, refer to a couple of specific and particular aspects uh, of, uh, of his uh, career in particular. He was uh, described regularly as an ambitious backbencher, ambitious of course being a dirty word when uh, coincided with backbencher uh, in the political uh, sphere sometimes, uh, and he served uh, a 
course, on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs from the very early 60s, from 1962, in an early indication of his recognition of Australia's importance uh, on the world stage. But it wasn't until 1966, some 11 years after he uh, joined the parliament following Robert Menzies' retirement, that Prime Minister Harold Holt then appointed Mr Fraser Minister for the Army. In 1966, as Minister for the Army, he visited Australia's troops in Vietnam. He also visited Thailand, Laos, Malaysia and the Philippines and made a very strong and real impression as an effective ambassador uh, for Australia. He was later appointed uh, by Mr Gordon, after Prime Minister Holt's death, as uh, Minister for Education and Science. Uh, he entered Cabinet as the Minister for Defence, of course, in 1969. However, he had what uh, you could politely describe as a falling out with Prime Minister Gordon and resigned that from his portfolio in March of 1971. Soon after, of course, as history tells us, uh, Mr Gordon was replaced by uh, Sir William McMahon and uh, he reappointed Mr Fraser to his previous portfolio of education and science. That was a short-lived uh, period uh, for Mr. Fraser uh, in that, uh, for Mr. McMahon as Prime Minister. I'm sorry, as uh, Mr. Whitlam then swept to power in 1972 with the. Uh, its time campaign. That was the first time uh, that uh, Mr Fraser had been consigned to the backbench, or to the opposition benches, I'm sorry, in his parliamentary career. And I'm sure uh, it was a rude awakening, as it often is, uh, when one has to change sides in this building, and in fact in the previous building. But the then opposition leader, uh, Sir Billy Sneddon, was quick to utilise Mr Fraser's talent and experience, and he appointed him Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations in 1973. And uh, in a uh, process that uh, had become perhaps uh, too familiar for those of us, those people close to Mr. Fraser, uh, it's fair to say, if I can put it this way, that Mr. Fraser and Mr. Steddon didn't really see eye to eye, uh, given the uh, leadership ambitions of Mr. Fraser continued to uh, to burn brightly um, as he was entitled to do, and. Um, that uh, led to uh, the coalition when the coalition was defeated in May of 1974. Again, that uh, led to Mr. Fraser launching his first leadership challenge against Billy Sneddon in the November of that year, which was defeated. In March, of course, the next year, he was successful in attaining the leadership of the coalition opposition. And uh, I heard uh, Senator Fifield paying tribute to his uh, leadership as opposition leader uh, and his great success uh, in that regard. 1975 became a very turbulent year. Uh, the Whitlam government was, uh, was uh, in great, uh, great stress and uh, distress, and the Fraser government put significant pressure um, on the government from the opposition by blocking money bills in the Senate. When uh, the, Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister refused to call an election, we all know that uh, on Remembrance Day 1975 the government was dismissed. And having been appointed caretaker Prime Minister, uh, Mr Fraser promptly called an election and won in a landslide that December. I remember well and adverted to uh, the feeling in my own family in December of 1975, in my home, the excitement at that victory um, of the Fraser government and uh, the team led by Mr Fraser was, uh, was very much to the forefront, uh, in, uh, certainly in my home, in my family and amongst my parents' friends. Uh, the view was that the election of the Fraser government would bring back stability for the nation after the chaos of the final months of the Whitlam government. And there were some very special achievements that Mr Fraser brought to bear as Prime Minister in the ensuing years. And uh, I want to refer to, uh, to a few of those, Mr President. The Fraser government created the special broadcasting service, SBS, in, in 1980, really bringing much closer engagement with very diverse parts of, uh, of our community through the production of radio and television news and programs in, uh, in multiple languages. And they cemented the concept of multiculturalism through the creation of the Ethnic Affairs Council, whose policies were to promote social cohesion, cultural identity and equality of opportunity. For those of us who uh, know and remember fondly our former colleague, the former member for Kuyong, Petro Giorgio, his contribution uh, working closely with Mr Fraser in the uh, establishment and uh, operation of the Ethnic Affairs Council uh, was also something that, uh, that Petro made sure we, uh, we never forgot. It's perhaps as, um, uh, as Prime Minister he became best known for instituting Australia's first seriously comprehensive refugee policy which was developed in response to the influx of the many Vietnamese asylum seekers fleeing their war-torn country. 
Between 1975 and 1982, about 200,000 immigrants, refugee immigrants, arrived uh, from Asia, 56,000 from Vietnam, in addition to the 2,000 who, Vietnamese who made the treacherous journey then by boat without documentation. He was immensely proud that these and other refugees from Asia were welcomed by Australia with open arms and open hearts. I was quite young at the beginning of, of that process. I perhaps didn't appreciate at the beginning of, of that stream of, of migration the humanitarian importance of what Australia did in those years, of what Malcolm Fraser did in those years. I remember uh, quite some time ago now, possibly even 15 years ago, going to uh, the Casula Powerhouse Arts Centre in Western Sydney near uh, Liverpool, which on three occasions since uh, 1997 has, uh, has staged three separate exhibitions, beginning firstly with Viet Voices in 1997, um, about, uh, about the uh, wave of migration. And on the first occasion that I was there, they had invited Mr Fraser, um, former Immigration Minister Mr McPhee, and uh, other leaders uh, of that time to attend. And there were countless elderly Vietnamese uh, community leaders there who adored Malcolm Fraser, who saw Malcolm Fraser as saving not just them, but saving their families. They loved him. And that love for me, I think, translates in the way he changed the face of our country in that period of time. The face that you see when you look back at Australia now in 2015 was fundamentally changed by Malcolm Fraser to be a diverse, a cohesive, open community. Western Sydney itself changed as well, culturally and dynamically. It was a fascinating period of, of time, and uh, his contribution to, to that will, will remain with us for, uh, forever, Mr President. Malcolm Fraser was an extraordinarily strong opponent of apartheid. He assisted in forming the 1997 Glen, 1977 Glen Eagles Agreement, insisting that South Africa end apartheid if it wanted to, for example, participate in the Commonwealth Games. He even refused to allow an aeroplane carrying the Springboks rugby team to land in Australia and refuel en route to New Zealand. Such was his disapproval of the apartheid regime. This, for me, at the time, as a, uh, I think, probably um, uh, year seven student, was an incredibly compelling issue. And the fact that it manifested itself in Australia around sporting participation was, I think, something that brought it back to Australian people in a way that perhaps it might not otherwise have, uh, have come to the fore. My respect and regard for his stand on apartheid was immense. It, um, for him, it, for me, uh, turned him into a towering figure on the world stage that really changed the way the South Africans were required to, uh, to operate. And not everyone in our party, not then and not later, supported his principled stand. And it was a, a, a matter of some contention, even some years later, as a very new member of the organisation, uh, when I would speak up in, uh, in party fora and, uh, and endorse and, in fact, applaud uh, Mr Fraser's position on this issue in New South Wales, I often found that, uh, that uh, it was not widely held, much to my surprise how times have changed. Much closer to home, he worked extraordinarily hard to advance the rights of Aboriginal Australians, pursuing, uh, even in those early years, constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians and pursuing the provision of land rights, particularly to, uh, to the Northern Territory. His government en enacted, finally, the, land the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in 1976. That drafting of, uh, of that legislation had been started by the previous government, and uh, he progressed that as a bipartisan project uh, to its uh, point of uh, fruition. The Fraser government also delivered the Aboriginal Develop Com Development Commission Act in 1981, providing funding mechanisms for Aboriginal housing and businesses. Those measures, uh, Mr. President, um, those measures I suspect uh, he hoped would have delivered uh, far greater return 
to Aboriginal Australians than they did, but that conversation has been continuing for a very long time. I am indeed grateful that, uh, that he began it in the way that he did. After he was defeated uh, and, uh, and left the, uh, the parliament, he continued, of course, his humanitarian work. He was appointed chair of the UN Panel of Eminent Persons on the role of transnational corporations in South Africa. He continued to be prominent throughout the 1980s in the efforts to, to end apartheid and served as joint chair of the Commonwealth Group of Eminent Persons Against Apartheid uh, in South Africa. He was, as everyone has said, uh, indefatigable, having left the parliament uh, at such uh, what I now regard as a very young age. Uh, he had many years ahead of him in which to continue to play a role in Australian society. And I'm not the first to say today, and I won't be the last, he continued to speak his mind on a range of issues and was never afraid of, uh, of uh, who may take offence uh, in the process. He was a small l liberal right to the end. He was an outspoken critic of uh, the Howard government of, uh, of, uh, on many issues, but particularly concerning uh, as uh, refugees and Aboriginal Australians. Most recently, he lent his stentorian tones, that powerful voice, to the Recognise campaign for constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. He was also a passionate advocate uh, for Australia becoming a republic, something which is uh, close to my heart uh, as well. For a couple of years in the uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, I was a member of the federal executive of the, uh, of the Liberal Party, and that was uh, the first opportunity I had to come to know Mr Fraser personally and, uh, and reasonably well in, in that role. But in 1982, when I joined the Liberal Party in New South Wales, the very first event that I attended as a new New South Wales young Liberal under the uh, tutelage of my then uh, very good friend Narell Donoghue, who was the finance director of the New South Wales Young Liberal Movement, was a cocktail party. I'm sure that's what it was called in 1982. I'm not sure we'd call it that now. But uh, a yeah, cocktail party um, at the Masonic Centre in Castle Ray Street in Sydney. Now, anyone who's familiar with the Masonic Centre will recognise its extraordinarily brutalist architecture. It didn't really fit with the uh, event of the day with the Prime Minister in the room. Um, I'm not sure whether it would be uh, diminishing for me to go into some detail of how I stressed about what I would wear that day, Mr President, but at uh, 20 and a little bit, it was uh, in fact not quite 20. Not 20. It was uh, an extraordinary opportunity for someone who really wanted to, uh, to become involved in politics, to be in the same room as the Prime Minister of Australia. From the uh, venue of such brutalist architecture, though, he gave a speech which was so compelling, so powerful and so engaging that literally those hundreds of people stood there in absolute silence, absolute silence, listening to, uh, to the Prime Minister speak. Uh, further, during my period uh, as, um, on the federal executive of the Liberal Party, I did um, uh, gainfully support his efforts for federal party presidency um, with my friend uh, John Brogdon in particular. Sadly, that was not to be, but I suspect in truth uh, it let him spend a great deal more of his time on other causes uh, in the end, Mr President. Um, but uh, it certainly got me into trouble along the way with a lot of other people who were not supporting Mr Fraser's efforts for the um, for the uh, Liberal Party presidency at the time. His advocacy for media diversity in this country took me one day to the Sydney Convention Centre to see him, I think on the first occasion this happened, share a stage with E.G. Whitlam to campaign for media diversity in this country. And having lived, of course, through 1975, and I think I was a university student when this particular campaign uh, took place, that was indeed a powerful joint message, uh, Mr President. He never took a backward step when he wanted to make a point. I've referred briefly to the Republic referendum campaign. I really welcomed his support and his leadership uh, in, that, uh, in that campaign, and I know there were many Republicans on this side of the chamber who valued that enormously to be able to look to uh, your former Prime Minister and, uh, and uh, receive that support was, uh, was very important for us in the uh, referendum campaign. Melbourne University Law School once, uh, um, some years ago now, uh, invited me to uh, share a platform uh, uh, with Mr Fraser in their Juris Doctor degree presentations. From that naive young Liberal of 1982 to finding myself on a platform uh, in any context giving a speech with uh, former Prime Minister Fraser was an extraordinary honour for, for me. He of course went on and uh, 
made a remarkable contribution to Australia's um, participation in the development sector, Mr President, through his establishment of Care Australia and his leadership of, uh, of that great organisation. And that, again, is another indelible uh, mark that he will leave on this country and on our, on our contribution internationally in the development uh, assistance space. Just three years ago, in 2012, I went with my, uh, with my partner, Stuart Ayres, the member for uh, Penrith, to hear Malcolm Fraser deliver the Gough Whitlam oration at the Riverside Theatre in Parramatta. The reason uh, I mention that, Mr President, is because there were only two Liberals in the room that day at least tagged and identified uh, as such, two Liberal elected representatives. It was an occasion upon which he shared with the nation and the world his views of the Australia-US alliance. And I must admit, sitting in the front row that day, I did twitch a little in my seat and think I'm not entirely sure Malcolm and I are going to agree on this point. But his delivery of that oration only three years ago, Mr President, its um, lucidity, its strength, uh, its direct message on the issues that he found so very important uh, was, uh, was a, a significant contribution in the annals of the, uh, of the, Gough, of the Whitlam Institute, and, uh, and I'm very, very pleased that, uh, that I attended uh, on that evening. There is, um, attached to the Institute at the University of Western Sydney, um, Mr President, a uh, Margaret Whitlam Gallery, and it has in it the most fabulous photograph of the First Ladies of Australia, as they were known. And uh, Mrs Fraser and Mrs Whitlam, amongst others, are depicted in uh, some of the uh, photographs exhibited uh, in that building, and it is uh, certainly something I would encourage all to see if they have a chance to visit the university and the institute. Whether it was constitutional change or human rights, his advocacy for multiculturalism, his commitment to the environment, his uh, forceful stance on asylum seeker policy. Malcolm Fraser was a true leader. He did differ with our political party in later years, but frankly, I have come to think about that as something that happens from time to time in families. It's not ideal, but it does happen. Relationships don't always function as we would hope, but I think that the opportunity to pay respect today and to, to make uh, remarks in this condolence debate is a very important part of acknowledging the quite extraordinary contribution of the man to this nation. To send our condolences to Mrs Fraser, to his children and grandchildren, and to say that uh, the loss of Malcolm Fraser is the loss of a great leader. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator Rice. Thank you, Mr President. I'm glad and I feel very privileged to have this opportunity to contribute to this condolence.